Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, sure. Let's see here. Um, so what I want to do is uh, I am recording this session. So let's start with the uh, scripting that you have for the AT&T account under the, uh, I think it was this uh, city group uh, supplier that we were working with. Right. So uh, let me open up my uh, email as well for reference so that we um, have that to, to refer to. Give me one moment to, to open that email. Uh, Chris, um, the account in question which we had in the email, now those are, uh, I suppose, uh, normal SBC accounts. So those, those have been uh, loaded. Now we are facing difficulties in the OneNet account. Mm -hmm. The accounts that start with 800, 1000, or 1800, which have multiple things in it. We have an uh, invoice in the folder. So you okay. had opened. Okay, so so let's start with um, a little bit of organizational issues. Um, putting all of the supplier invoices for multiple accounts into a single folder is not recommended. And the reason is is that from my experience, it, all it does is create confusion. Because you may have different scripts, like you have an ABN shortcut in here, you have a business direct uh, shortcut in here, you have an SBC shortcut in here, one for running off of a text file, one for running off of a, of, of a PDF file. Um, this is actually an AT&T wireless device report. And so um, uh, putting all of these into the same folder is, and commingling all of these different accounts is only going to cause problems. It's going to cause confusion and uh, basically slow you down. So I would say f first and foremost, create a structure. Uh, we use a standard structure within our organization and um, that structure I will show you um, is that we have a, uh, a folder structure that is consistent for all uh, clients. So you'll see here that we have this client folder structure template Within it, we have uh, several subfolders, and we make a copy of this for every client. So no matter who's working on a client, they know exactly where to go to find information. So within uh, the subfolder structure, we have one called production records. You can call it whatever you want, but underneath that would be where your uh, uh, service provider invoices would reside. So let me show you an, uh, a specific example of a client that um, okay. where we have a production folder and within there you'll see we have AT&T, AT&T Wireless, Avaya, CenturyLink, Verizon, Windstream, okay. Within those st structures we know that if we're working on an AT&T account we're going to go in and there's a series of folders, one per account, okay. So there's no question what folder you need to go to when you're working on a specific account, okay? And within that account, we will have the very specific, um, uh, like some accounts, this is, happens to be a, an account that we use a um, uh, billing edge CD for the call detail. So uh, we keep all of the invoices within this folder. If we have a different account, that uses a different script, then we will uh, keep all of those invoices uh, within that folder. So we are s confining or encapsulating all of the information for a single account in a single folder. And when it comes to running a uh, script, we know that within a particular folder that we have a single shortcut that is always going to consistently uh, match that billing format for that uh, account. So first and foremost, I recommend adopting a standard like this. Well, th this looks good. I understand uh, okay. the ma major thing that we will have to change in our structure. But the thing is, just we were only uh, doing some practice, trying to run different scripts. Actually, we didn't know which script to run. So on which account, so we were using multiple scripts, but 
right, the right. thing that I, showed this, this, yeah. But once you once you do understand the script, you don't you want to solve that problem one time, right? So you right. don't want to keep right. having to struggle over and over with the same account every time. So identify, and we can help you if you have a problem. But it will become fairly self-evident, and the scripts themselves are uh, becoming more and more self-documenting to identify what the um, uh, uh, I parameters of that script are for. So for example, if I um, run one of the scripts uh, and it has a, uh, are you seeing my desktop? Yes, yes, we are. Okay. The dash H option is the, that it prints out help about the script. Um, and the f syntax for all scripts is always an input file name, an output file name, and then some optional parameters, and dash H is one of those options. So I'm going to give it an input file name. I'm going to just create a, 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 a uh, sample output file name, and then I'm going to put dash H. And what that's going to do is it's going to provide information about the script itself. Now, I have to uh, mention that some of our scripts were created from files that were provided to us without information as to where they came from. So the help files are limited to some of the information that we you know, ha have available to us. So depending on the uh, nature of the script, <coughs> we may have very detailed information about how to log into the website, what the URL is, and how to navigate through their website in order to download let's say call detail record uh, uh, files that the script is designed to work with. And other times we will have very minimal information because it wasn't provided to us uh, when we were developing the script for that particular file. But we were not given the you know, information on the details. But we're always continually working towards you know, improving the documentation so that um, it's, it's understood uh, where the um, information came from. So now, obviously, the carriers also change their their um, websites, and so what we document on you know on one uh, point in time may no longer be valid if they redesign their website, which happens all the time. So you know the, they're only valid within you know the, the 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 parameters of the carrier websites. Okay, so I also want to um, recommend a second once you the. Uh, establish a standard uh, folder structure to put, store the invoices and their corresponding scripts, then um, what we do within our system is we um, uh, create a, uh, let's say, some documentation within our system so that we can, let me just, uh, pull a uh, particular account here that would be uh, relevant. One, mi one moment, please. I'll just use yes, a uh, windscreen. <coughs> OK, excuse me. So this is a, uh, an example of some notes that we have in a, um, in a folder for a windstream account. And there are two things that you can do. First of all, you can copy and paste a, uh, you, a, a link to a folder into TAM so that when you click that link, it opens that folder directly. So um, the way that we're, we do this is we can take, uh, like I'm working off my local machine, but you can do the same thing up on the uh, G drive um, for the uh, hosted environment. And I will take a copy of this um, URL or the path to that folder, and I will put it into the notes. I'll do it down here at the bottom so that you can see. And you'll notice how this is a rich text format file, and rich text formats do not uh, like spaces. So what you do is you highlight the entire your uh, path, and then you uh, select the convert to link. And now it creates a standard art rich text format link to that folder. And you can click that link and it will open that folder. So first, it gets you right to the right folder, very efficient, and you're always going to be in the right place. You don't have to think about where to navigate or which, and notice we have the shortcut in there that is designed for this account. 
okay? Right. So this organization yeah. is going to make you very, very efficient, and no matter who works on an account, they will always do the same thing. It's a systematic approach, and it will uh, pr protect against, you know, um, problems of, of using the wrong script or being in the wrong account. That happens many, many times. I've observed people without an organizational structure try to import the wrong information into the wrong account because they have it all commingled and it's just a jumbled mess. So avoid that trap. Provide some structure and organization to your system and it will serve you very well. The other part that we do within the notes, notice we're on a WinStream account with this account number. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also put in the documentation as to which script needs to be run and a sample of the commands. Okay. Notice there's a, a input file name and an output file name. We always use a standard naming convention of using year, month, and day uh, that as a beginning, so that when we sort by file name, we will always know. Not only do we we have them in chronological order. And every month, all I have to do, or all anybody on my staff has to do, to do the next month is to change from January to February, and then run the. And we can copy and paste right out of the. Uh, I, I use my keyboard shortcuts of Control C, but you can use the the menus, and then you would um, come to that script, Windstream script right here, and then paste it directly, it's, it's open on my other screen here, paste the command directly into it. It's that simple to go from, um, you know, one month to the next, and I always have the same shortcut that's compatible. So once you we get the right script for a given account, you never have to change it. So I so, right. uh, want to emphasize that. Now, there's another part of the scripts that are important to, to understand. Some of our scripts um, require a text file import. Some of them are uh, already common delimited files as the input file. Um, and others maybe can work directly off of a PDF. And there are a variety of the, uh, reasons, technology reasons, that I you know, won't go into too much ex uh, explanation on. Um, but uh, w they, they do tell you in the scripts what type of input it is expecting, and again, the dash H option can also further provide more information about the source of the input file. So in this case, we start with a PDF file, but we have to manually copy and paste it to a TXT file before we import it. So, um, and that's, uh, like I said, there's a, a multitude of reasons, but in this case, it, it would require a manual step to copy and paste the text file or the PDF file to a text file, um, and, and uh, it's o it only takes 15 seconds to do that. You know, it's a very short step. Other times, if we can extract it directly from the PDF file, we have some scripts that will tell you that it wants a PDF as an input. <clears throat> now, I want to just talk to you about Windows in general because this is not a TAMS issue this is about Windows Explorer, and it's a it's a basic element of Windows that trips a lot of people up. So if we go into the folder options, and I change one of my settings, which is unfortunately the default, is to um, hide extensions for known file types. If I apply that, notice I actually see two file names over here that look to be identical. Of course, they're not because it's hiding the full file name. The scripts require the full file name. So if you are hiding the extensions, <clears throat> which again is unfortunate that it's the default for Windows, um, then th there is clearly um, a problem if you try to just give this name, 2016-01-01, to the script as an input file without any extension, it's not going to know which one of these is b being requested as input, right? So you do not, uh, I sh you should not, you should always know what type of file you're working with. Of course, it does say over here on the right what type of file, but rather than struggle with that dimension of Windows Explorer, just come in and on your particular login, change your setting to unhide, apply it, and then apply it to all folders. And then it should re remember that your setting is to 
always show the full file name, just like we did in our command over here. We put a .txt as part of the file name because it really is part of the file name. Hiding those file name extensions is only going to cause problems. All right. Okay. So, um, so let me uh, uh, go back to the email, and then we can take a look at your particular uh, account. Did you say that um, that the account that starts with seven seven zero, and I did notice that it had a .dot pdf .dot pdf, that you were able to successfully run the script and import the usage for that account? Yes, after the things you mentioned, like the extension was uh, updated, everything you said we did it, we have uploaded it, but the issue that we couldn't understand in this thing was the three-way calling part which you had identified. Uh, the three-way calling, uh, yes. That thing is added in uh, TAMPS. We have added that account. If you can open that account and see what we did. But uh, the problem is that three-way calling is a usage uh, chart. So yes. we placed it as an MRC, are we suppose. Oh, we I know. OK, so that's incorrect. So let, let me show you how that works, because once you know how an ancillary, most of the usage, uh, like 98% of the time or 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to be one of the standard feature uh, service types of either local usage long distance, mm -hmm. local toll, or toll free on the landline side of, of things. Every once in a while you get something like this uh, account where they have um, three -way calling or correct, collect call. Three -way there. Calling. Now let's see if I'm opening the correct account here. Uh, don't know if I am or not. Oh, uh, no, the other seven account is not this one. Uh, this one. Yes. Okay. Great. And then, right. So as you can see, they charge three dollars per call for three-way calling. So that's a usage-based uh, service. So what I need to do is I need to log in. Um, is there? Is it okay if I use one of your uh, login uh, uh, accounts? For, yes, uh, uh, you can use the same account. We have the data added in TAMS in our account. But okay, the thing hang, is, this, this charge has been, uh, I think, added as an MRC. We just wanted you to check if that is uh, done correctly. Okay, let, let me log in under one of your login IDs. I can't open it under the, the test one that I have, so let me um, just uh, uh, log in under one of your IDs. And we'll, we'll uh, examine that, and if there's any adjustments that need to be made, we can fix it very easily. So. Um, <laughs> It's it's seismic zero one I suppose the login ID. Which one? Seismic zero one. Zero one. Okay, I'll use that one. Okay. So give me one second. Oh, okay, still it uh, loads in. I just have one question. Uh, the login that we are using, uh, does it support multi-user login? Means one single login can be used by multiple uh, stations? Yes, but not simultaneously. In order to use a login, there's no concurrency on a single login ID, but you do have multiple login IDs. You have a Seismic 01, a Seismic 02, and a Seismic uh, LN for Lou. So uh, yes. those are, um, of course, they can work concurrently. No, I, I was asking because uh, if uh, somebody is logging with uh, over at two different stations, I don't want the things to be duplicated. Like he has, he is working on the same account, and the other guy is also working on the same account. By mistake, they open with same ID, so I don't want it to have any 
uh, duplicacy of work or something like that. Yes. Now, is so there is uh, something to be concerned with with uh, concurrency, um, and that is um, if two people are working on the same account at the same time under two separate login IDs, it is possible oh. for them to kind of uh, create a conflict or a collision in their um, in their uh, uh, update. So for example, if I'm logged in under Seismic01 and I come into this AT&T account, the, the one that ends in 0202, and I type a note, my note, and I before I click save, um, somebody else under a different login comes in to the 0202 account, the same account for the same client, and they type something else in there. Now whoever clicks save last is going to end up that's going to overwrite the record that stores that information. So if we both click save, whoever was last, their information is going to overwrite the first information. So there is a, a potential for, but that's the nature of a server environment when you're working off of shared data. Um, just like if you and your wife were both working on a, uh, uh, you know, entry in your checking account at the same time, and it was the same check, and you changed the notes or the balance on the check then you're writing to the same record. So it is possible to have a, a problem like that. Obviously, um, division of labor so that you don't have two people working on the same account at the same time, that would be highly inefficient anyway. So I would just uh, you know, try to uh, assign the work so that, I mean, they can work within the same client, um, no problem, or just different accounts or different locations. You know, But if they're working off of the uh, same account at the same time, then yes, you could um, have one person overwrite the other person. No, no, no. thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so let me uh, clear that note. Um, and uh, let's go to that account that we were talking about with the um, with the three-way calling. And again, what I would do here. Uh, and I will do it on this account, and then you can um, you can uh, mirror this uh, uh, capability. So uh, it looks mm -hmm. like you actually have uh, is it CIPI group, City Group? Okay. So I think that maybe first of all, I would change the the spelling here. Uh, it looks like a little typo. So rather than uh, uh, inherit that typo over and over and over. We might as well make it right uh, to, be, to begin with. And then um, what, what I'm going to do, if, if you don't mind, is I'll create a folder just for this one account and isolate, and then you can mimic this for everything else, duplicate it, okay? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so I'm going to create a new folder and just give it the account number. And this is nice because then the, there's a consistency between TAMs and uh, the, your folder structure and the suppliers and the way they uh, build everything. So it's all, it's all consistent. So what I'm going to do is I copied and pasted that and I'm going to convert it to a link. And so now if I close this folder and I come into uh, TAMs, I can access that folder by just clicking on the link and it opens up that folder and takes me directly to that folder. So, um, so that's a time saver, and it helps uh, avoid um, being in the wrong folder when you're working on things. I'm going to take these uh, files that we have, plus this file, uh, plus this file. Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. This looks like it's part of it. I'm not sure if those others are part of it or not. So let's. Uh, cut those and paste them down into this subfolder. So I, I may have um, everything uh, confined in this folder. I don't know if, if there's anything else in this folder that belongs with that account. I don't think so, but I'll leave it as is for now. OK. Now, you'll notice we actually still have two scripts here. Okay, we do have a script that is designed to work off of the PDF file as an input. Now, when we have a, a, a script that works off of the PDF, 
it will always extract the information to a text file automatically as an intermediate step before it produces the call detail records. So this text file is actually generated by the script. And I'm going to delete it just to demonstrate it to you. The other thing that we uh, do not need is two copies of a script. This one is designed, it was an earlier incarnation of the script, and it's designed off of a TXT file from a PDF, where you would copy and paste it to a PDF. Okay, the, the one that has an XPDF, that one uses a, actually a third party extractor for text, extract, extract, Thing from uh, a PDF file, and it expects a PDF file as an input. So you must use the correct script for the correct input. We're, since we have one that matches the PDF, we're going to save the manual step of having to copy and paste. So I'm just going to eliminate that shortcut from this um, folder. We don't need it. Okay. So in TAMS, I'm going to document that we're going to use um, the ATP. SBC XPDF dot VBS script command. And I'll go ahead and bold that and underline underscore it. And what is our command? Well, we're gonna have um, now notice this is just an account number. There is no um, billing month listed on the account number. That um, it's going to be a problem if you want to do more than one month of data, right? So you want the file names to be unique. So let's find out what month this actually is so that we have a naming convention that does not, uh, this is September 11th of 2015. Okay. So um, we're going to, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to rename this, uh, this file. That's that's okay, Chris. Okay, great. So now we actually have a standard naming convention that we could use multiple months in the same folder, and we're going to uh, put a sample of that file name here as our input, and then we're going to change the uh, output to something like CDR dot CSV. So that's going to be our output file name. And if we wanted to uh, create the uh, inventory of lines that are in this account as a uh, I input, but you typically only have to do this the very first month, then you will have a separate command, but it doesn't need to be run every month. It only tends to be run the very first month that you're establishing a baseline. So um, yeah. if we now run this script, you'll see that um, it does have a dash D to output the DNs for line details import. And without any options, it's always, and this is true for every every script, without any options, the standard output is to output usage, the like call detail records, okay? So, um, all right, so, so let's run this for the call detail. And it uh, runs. Uh, it's over in my other uh, screen here. One second, I'll drag it over for you. There it is. And it runs, and of course, it gives me the uh, results. Now, you can do this account for as many months as you want to, and all you have to do is edit maybe the month or on a once every 12 months, edit the year. <laughs> as long as you follow the convention, it's going to be the same. And that can be true for every account for every client. Okay. Right. So now, of course, the 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 only setup challenge is to make sure you have the right script for each account. So, uh, and that's a one-time setup. You don't have to deal with that every month. Okay. So we did get the call detail records. They're right here in this um, file, and I'm going to open them up and drag it over here, so that we can just take a look at what the, what's included in this file. Here's the billing telephone number, the date, and here's those three-way calls. So let's take a look at this phone number because I want to see what type of three-way calling plan. Remember, it's not a local plan. It's not a long-distance plan. It's not a toll-free plan. It's a three-way calling plan that bills at $3 per call, right? So um, I'm just going to um, do a Control-F to do a find phone number, and I'm going to navigate to the history of this phone number. 
So that history, uh, the 5591, I do see a three-way calling usage. Perfect. So let's take a look at that ancillary feature. And uh, I can do that by uh, right-clicking on it and say View Plan Details. So you can navigate very rapidly around in TAMS by right-clicking on most things um, in order to, to jump to another uh, part. And so because we have a plan here, I want to take a look at those plan details. I'm going to just pull this one a little bit bigger for myself. And I see that it, does, it has a monthly charge of $9. Of course, that's not going to always be $9 every month. So instead of a monthly recurring charge, what we're going to do is we're going to put a per unit rate of $3 per call. Okay? So now it actually oh. has a metered cost component, not a monthly recurring cost component. You comfortable with that? That is the thing, yeah, that is the thing we were missing. Okay, we great. Call so, uh, identify. Right. So now, when we're importing this usage, and by the way, I'm just going to um, I'm going to to delete the usage that you have in there because I'm going to re-import it because I want you to see how ancillary usage is then uh, handled. Now, you might have more than one type of ancillary feature on uh, mm -hmm. one or more lines. And so you could have different ancillary features. It's very, very unusual to have more than one type of ancillary usage charges, um, but it, it can happen, right? And you're not restricted yeah. from having multiple ancillary features with metered usage on a, the same line. So uh, if we are importing ancillary usage, okay, and I'm going to go do a mixed mode import, I'm going to uh, do an add up. But one thing I want to check here on Citigroup is um, do you have, see, you don't have a root folder established for this client. And again, this is part of the standard uh, setup for a client to establish a, um, a root folder for each client so that when you start to import data, it will always start you off in that folder. If, if you don't do this, as you, as you build more clients, and you start importing, many times people are navigating around in the whole wrong folder structure and you don't want to go there, you know. So let's go ahead and now try to um, import here under mixed mode import. Uh, we're going to be working off the September 11th, 2015, and we do an add update billing cycle. And now it, it already has a, 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 a billing cycle for September 11th, so it's just going to be updating that cycle instead of creating a new one. And notice it started me off in the city group folder. Now again, you may want to start changing your folder structure here, but I, you know, because as you start to put links to certain folders, if you change your folder structure, you're going to break those links, just like changing a URL on a website. So uh, I would say establish a standard first, and then start adhering to it, uh, so that all of your references, you know, will will be consistent and uh, will not change. Um, okay, so now uh, here's this uh, call detail records, that, and we just select that file. Notice that for the ancillary usage, it's asking, hey, this import file has some ancillary usage in it. What feature is that supposed to be assigned to? Because you have three features set up on this account. It doesn't show you every feature for AT&T for every client in the universe. It's only showing you the ones where you have ancillary features set up on this account, because they're the only ones that are relevant. And of course, we know that it's the three-way calling usage. So now it, um, it imports that, that, those three records for three-way calling and I noticed that the um, the other usage that it imported was coming in as um, invalid uh, costs. So uh, if this is up to you. You can import the cost as is and accept these records and the t and the actual cost that was billed, like a dollar fifty and twelve dollars and a dollar fifty and four fifty. It's going to you know import those costs. Um, and it should still reconcile. However, the plan that you have for, um, uh, let's see, the plan name is called Business Line $2. It looks like um, they're supposed to be billing a dollar and a half per minute 
uh, on these um, local toll calls, but yet your plan is not calibrated to um, uh, document that it is a dollar and a half. Um, oh, you I'm mean to say the rate? Let, let, let's not fix given. this just while we're recording this, so that you can see exactly how these local toll plans are are defined. So you have a local toll and a local toll for two dollars and two dollars. If I view the plan details, again a local toll plan. See how these are all zero? Yes, I understand. Uh, there's no uh, rate matrix written over there. Pardon me. The rate matrix, uh, the how much per call charge is there? We have not added that. So right now right. it's a zero, zero, zero. And, yep, and and you can easily determine the rates from the call detail file um, by using our rate calculator, um, where um, this is a, a built-in tool that will take the standard import call detail record file and do a linear regression analysis on it, so that you can see that it's a dollar fifty per minute for local toll. Okay, so and it's a hundred percent correlation to the eleven records that are in that import file. Um, so, some accounts, like a OneNet account, much more complicated because it probably covers many accounts and or many locations, different states with different rates and so on. So we can right. change this to a um, dollar and a half a minute for these two um, for the for this plan. Okay, and uh, mm -hmm. we can. Uh, if we come back to import the under mixed mode import, I did not save the previous import data, okay? But now I select the file and I also tell it that, hey, the ancillary usage is the three-way calling. Notice all of them are, are valid now. I did not get any invalid and it says right here at the bottom, there were 14 records, all 14 were valid. So now you have oh. a well calibrated uh, uh, plan and, and we would then be able to compare that usage and that plan to any other account with any other plan parameters and get an accurate estimate of you know how much the, uh, could be saved. So we're just going to accept that usage now and all 14 got accepted. If I double click and drill into this you'll notice that the ancillary usage is now in there at three dollars per call uh, for the, the usage. Okay, and all of the local toll is also in here. So of course, uh, when you calculate, assuming everything else is is accurate um, in here, then the uh, costs are going to match, uh, and they match to exactly. So it looks like you had a one cent billing adjustment in there, uh, just to maybe take care of a tax issue or something like that. So so that um, is is it in a nutshell. Every other account is the same as this, except some of them are many, much more complex. Chris, Chris, sorry to interrupt. One question: that adjustment that we saw over there, it has been uh, done by the tool itself, or <laughs> it was before already placed? Because we had placed one adjustment. It's the same that we did, right? Not the tool uh, did it. Um, sorry, thing. what what are you asking about the tool doing versus? No, no, uh, I'm asking like uh, when we had uh, added uh, this uh, these charges manually, uh, we were getting a mismatch of 0 0.01 uh, cents, right? 0 0.01 dollar. So we had added this adjustment on the first one. Yes. So this is Th what we have added manually. Yes, this I did not delete oh. your billing adjustment. Okay. okay. Um, I did delete your usage and re-imported it. And of course now the one difference between what you had before and what you have now is that the three-way calling was listed as an MRC of $9. Yeah. It's no longer an MRC. It's now usage-based. Okay. And right. that will allow for month-to-month -month variations in usage and the corresponding changes in cost. If you were to make this nine dollars as an MRC, and next month they have twelve dollars or six dollars, you know your, your your MRC is a moving target. So you definitely want to model usage as usage. Right. Uh, that that was that was the concern the team had uh, to ask me about. Like, if we have a nine dollar plan right now, then do we need to create a twelve dollar plan next month? That would be like difficult to handle later. Yeah, and now that wanted. you have a calibrated model that's accurate, next month, if you were to run another month, so we would come back here to the mm -hmm. notes, change this from 9 to 10, 
and as long as you name the file the same a convention right and then copy and paste this into the shortcut you would just come over here put in 10 11 put in the new grand total which might be hundred and eighty two dollars and fifteen cents or something like that and then import the usage accordingly and uh, and everything should match with with the exception of maybe you might be a penny or two off due to tax variations so the mechanics of doing multiple months is trivial once you've got the first month calibrated properly so um, all right. that's all there is to it yep um, thank you okay. a lot for uh, no. not understand this account. Okay, so so now no, let's go back to your other uh, concern because I think we covered the scripting, the convention of yes. the file convention. Again, look, I would actually take the city group instead of just putting one account underneath because account numbers are um, hard to understand. Okay, it's easier. Okay. I would say start with a supplier you know, and then the account number, and so that you have a little more uh, structure, particularly if you start to deal with very large clients. You need some organization. So before you go too much further, I would establish that file structure standard, and then things like these links. You can delete them and recreate them, but you don't want to have to create a whole bunch and then go back and redo the work. So if you, if you, you know, Set, do a, a proper setup. It'll save you uh, time down the road. Yes, actually, the team is here learning, and try, and the input that you are giving, they're writing it down. Actually, so I think we will learn a lot in yeah. coming times from you. Okay, so uh, let's see here. So the other account looks like you do have a OneNet account. Uh, that's the yes. 8080 account. Yes, and there are actually two types of accounts that we uh, usually come across, other than the SBC account. Uh, one is this one it account, and another another is the convergent account. If you remember, the card number is starting with 831, which either can have a MPLS server, the router IDs, or something like that. Right, right. Or, or many local accounts converged to one master account so those are yes. the two means of two types of accounts that we have we have currently nine with us this is the one example we could locate to share with you okay so uh, let's do an uh, again a new uh, folder here um, for that account and um, again I would probably put all these under AT&T you know in the, in the hierarchy of the folder structure um, Geez, let me see here. Uh, I'm not sure where these two came from. They they have no account number associated to them, so I'm a little bit uh, uh, unsure about these toll-free. Um, oh, I have it open. Let me close that. Um, so when it comes to uh, so, let, let's take a look at this account because we want to, like you said, start with the proper uh, script. And once we get the script, then you'll just repeat it every month and it won't be a problem. So uh, right. I, I want to take a look at this because there are other bills. Uh, those 831s, um, I think you're talking about maybe a convergence bill uh, where um, it comes out of Business Direct, but it is a roll-up of multiple accounts. And, yes, multiple um, reasons. Yeah, and I want to show you some of the, um, let's take a look at this. There's a toll-free number, usage charges. Yeah. Now, notice this bill is, is a sort of a summary bill where it shows usage charges, um, and it also shows um, some other uh, charges for long distance. Okay, and then uh, I think up above it may show discounts on those charges. Well, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with these uh, bills here. Um, yeah, so there's two usage charges. Uh, under the pricing volume, I see the credit it looks to be nearly identical to the usage. Uh, BTNS usage volume pricing plan, 69, 67.99 credit. Uh, which is the same amount as the usage charges. 
I'm wondering if they're getting uh, free calling or unlimited calling on this account, um, which is fine. We can we can credit. Uh, we can do 100% volume discounting in TAMS as well. Uh, just to, to uh, point this out here, um, eight. I don't see the account in here anywhere. Uh, uh, we have not created a account because we couldn't identify the script to run for it. Okay. So okay. We have not added. It's a clean account, I would say. Yeah. Let me just show you one thing on any any one of these accounts. If you come into the um, sub account and click on the billing parameters for the sub account, you can put in uh, volume discounts of any you know zero to a hundred percent and you can actually have three different tiers where you have the local and in-state um, or ancillary features you can have interstate and international um, discount vo volume discount percentages so that allows you to model exactly what the carriers are doing um, so just be aware that the volume discounting capability is also built into uh, the TAMS uh, capabilities. But um, the usage that uh, is in this account does not actually, is not contained within the uh, PDF. They do show some intermediate level, like there's very high level grand totals showing the usage up above. Then they show some intermediate level usage for um, intrastate, intralata um, calling. And um, you can see that there are uh, there's some on this long distance, uh, and then there's also some uh, on this toll free, and they show a, a what I call an intermediate level because it's showing the total number of calls for daytime, evening, night, the total minutes, and the total costs. Okay, but that's before discount. Um, so these are the raw costs pre-discounted. Um, and uh, if you continue on down through here, they do not actually show the call detail. So we have scripts that are designed to extract um, intermediate level detail. We would call this aggregate usage um, so that you can uh, it pull this information out of this file and import it as is. Or you can download uh, the call detail records from the carrier uh, website under Business Direct and run a different script that would actually bring in call by call detail to CDR. So we have the mechanisms to work off of different types of, of billing platforms. And so this one in particular I'll show you is called, um, let me see here one second. You are talking about the uh, files which have outbound local and toll-free uh, toll usage in the BDA Business Direct portal. We need to download yeah, so, both. So, so, yeah, so let's, let's, um, let's talk about the uh, Business Direct OCD, uh, which is uh, outbound call detail. Uh, let's see if I have a help on this one. I do. So let me cancel this. I'm going to copy this over into this folder for just for now, and I'm going to uh, run the script. I'm going to say text dash h for the help. All right, now, this one has quite a bit of information about it. Um, unfortunately, it wraps. So you can see there's quite a bit of help here. But it says, steps for running the outbound call detail report. So you would log into Business Direct, go to View, Analyze, Pay Bill, go to the View Bill, Call Detail Download, and so forth. And you would follow these steps. Notice that there are sometimes more than one option because they change things around. And we try to document, like this would be the toll-free call detail as well. So if you go gather a uh, the file, and we even show you what the um, – the call detail download record structure looks like from the website, it's going to look like one of these uh, file structures. And again, it's uh, there's some variation that comes from the carrier depending on the steps that you follow and, and you know, the point in time. But these files 
are the compatible formats for this script. So the uh, script does not work uh, off of the PDF. It works off of the call detail from um, the uh, Business Direct. Now, one question. So that that thing. Listen, pardon me. Chris? Yeah, there was a one question in that uh, CMD window that you had opened. Yes. Just one question there. If you can open it again, I oh, want sure. to ask one. And you know what I, I like to do here, by the way, um, I'm going to also show you something else that uh, message. I change my um, settings. Let, let me do it for you on this account. Uh, defaults. The um, width probably was just the. Let's let's see how I want to just try this one more time for you. I I change my um the setting for the, the default window. so that I can get a much bigger uh, window that doesn't have the wrapping. There you go. Okay, so go ahead. What's your question? Uh, if, if you can uh, scroll down, uh, that, uh, the fields. Now, when we download the file from uh, Business Direct portal, these are the columns in same order we have to have on that file, right? Or yes, and that should be the standard. If, if you don't do not customize the reports and follow the instructions mm -hmm. that are documented at the top, you uh, should get uh, f f files that are uh, delimited in this uh, format. Yeah, because we tried it, uh, we ran the BD report, and I think this was the error that we might have faced. Like the columns were not uh, as per the requirement. Okay, well, let me also tell you that our script, their scripts are designed to be, uh, f uh, let's say, tolerant to some uh, variation. Okay, so for example, okay. let's say that. Uh, when this script was created, that the call date was in call in field 10 that we see, um, you know, right right in here where the call date uh, is field 10. And it has okay. this particular format of year, 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 month, month, day, day. All right. Now, let's say that, um, you know, from the time the script was written and, and you know, written to this specification, and now that somebody comes in and they change the format so that there's a different field added in column 3 and column and field 10 becomes field 11 but it's still the call date and it's still in a year 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 month month day day format our script is designed to to be able to identify that it changed position but that the format is still the same and it will still work so there is uh, some tolerance in the design of the scripts to allow for some variation so that we don't have to continually have to maintain every time or if they, let's say they add some columns to the end, which is quite col common, but there are things like an authorization code or something that is irrelevant to our extraction of the call detail, which includes the originator, the terminator, the duration, and the cost. You know, if they add some things like taxes or something that are not relevant to us, they're not going to break our script. So, uh, but be aware that they could break the script, and a script that is working fine for you all of a sudden stops working properly, then that's when you would open a request with us to review and modify the script to update it to the new, you know, format. So there can yeah. be, you know, um, unfortunately AT&T has a an army of programmers that do nothing but come in and change their systems every day, and it makes life difficult for everybody else who's trying to use their systems. Um, so anyway, um, but but you know, if you get it to work on the first month, and if that's one of the challenges, is to identify what is my source of data for call detail that I need to get for this account. And this particular account that you have, there are multiple sources. Oh, and by the way. 
things like being able to, to pull this report off of Business Direct is subject to your permissions for your login ID. Sometimes you have to go to the account rep and ask them to add certain um, applications and permissions to your login ID in order to be able to get that information. So it's not just about our scripting, it's also about the account and the permissions and the setup uh, with the carrier. AT&T is one of the more complicated ones. Um, again, once you are set up, then it should flow through very, very easily. Um, but, you know, you go to a different client, different login ID, you may have to jump through those same hoops uh, more, than, more than once. Yes, we have been working with AT&T for the last... Yeah. So you My understand, answer, right? And mind. what we're trying to do is is to make a, create a repeatable system that works for a, a broad variety of clients and carriers, and uh, and and allows for the usage to be imported, and then you can analyze it, operate on it, find savings, bill for savings, create reports of devices with, uh, lines with no usage, and so on. So you know. Um, we uh, uh, have been very successful across many clients and many uh, consultant firms across U.S. and Canada doing this for 14 years, um, but it's, uh, it's not a static system is my point is that sometimes, you know, there's changes need to be made. And fortunately, you know, as us being a central um, uh, you know, skill set for maintaining the scripts um, and, and the Developing and modifying them, you know, it saves everybody that that effort. So, um, All right. Yep. I okay. think we should be able to run uh, this account using the uh, business direct files now, because as we have a, a little time crunch over there, we have another call after 15, 15 minutes. Yeah, I have another so, one coming up as well. Now, let me just say have, there is another script. More that you could uh -huh. run against uh, this file that would, instead of going and getting the call detail from Business Direct, which is what I always recommend, okay, we have uh -huh. another script that would allow you to extract this intermediate level of usage, which is kind of aggregated, and uh, I, I, uh, what I'll do is I will put it, um, I don't see the shortcut for you, and it's called the uh, VTNS. Uh, you notice this is a VTNS uh, account, and we yes. have a script that's designed for this PDF uh, to pull out this level of information of usage. So, so again, it can we give might have more than one solution for you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, with using the VTNS uh, script, we can get a detail like the call was done on day, these many calls are done, this is the total of number of charges of on it. You mean to say like that, right? Yeah, it would bring, it would it would show a oh, call record yeah. of 37 calls with 135.9 minutes and six dollars and 32 cents in aggregate costs for this phone number, okay? And then it would show a oh, second yeah. call record of four calls in five minutes because our call records can be aggregate records; they don't have to be individual calls. They can be aggregated just like they look right. here. Yeah. Yeah, it's under so totally understand. So that script has to be used for such a such case if we need a uh, summary type of details to be added in terms. And if we need yeah. a detailed one, we need to use the Excel sheet set, uh, the CSV file, sorry, to be downloaded from the business direct. Yep. Okay. And so, uh, and, and you know, if you have um, a question, send a copy of uh -huh. the bill over and then, uh, I mean, we've seen so many of these things for so long that we can say, oh, here's the appropriate script to use for, for that format of an okay. invoice. Well, uh, we will surely do that. Now, only the uh, only question that, uh, only account that is left, I don't have the account right now with me. It would be the 831 convergent or I think it's MNS account, managed inter network services account. What I'll do is uh, I'll try to get that account for you. The team, uh, Yogendra or someone from the team, uh, at Probably assume Yoginder will be sending you that uh, file, that PDF. Okay. And okay, uh, now let me, let me just say for a, a managed internet service or an MPLS like AVPN account or uh, AVPN for AT and T, they tend to not right. have any metered services, and so there's really no scripting required because there's nothing that varies from month to month. They tend to be very very static and consistent month to month, and it's all MRC and taxes. So I would say. 
uh, look at the bill before you send it just to see if is there any usage that needs to be extracted um, that is okay. metered usage. If not, you don't even need a script. You can just create the plans as ancillaries, uh, as data oh, okay. ancillaries. You know, there's a subtype for data and internet ancillaries. And you just stick those onto the circuits and you're done. So you don't need to run a script every month. All right, understood. Because uh, those are the two confusions that we had, the team had actually. Okay. So I wanted to clear that. So I yeah. think that's uh, good for today. A lot of things yeah. that I to understand and work with. And uh, please do send the, this recording to us, a link for this recording. You so bet. that we can reference the apps.